The Sideways, Book One, Awake, written and narrated by Andy Havens. If you're enjoying the podcast or you've enjoyed the written book, we'd always appreciate a share on your favorite social network. That's www.the-side-ways.com. Thanks for listening. Chapter 5. Sign. From above the plain, very little detail is visible to you at first. Your eyes would only be able to make out the billowing clouds of dust and a relatively empty space between two undulating masses of shadow and reflection. The sky overhead is overcast but bright, one of those annoying days when the light hurts your eyes no matter which direction you look but it doesn't seem to be able to penetrate the clouds. Then on the wings of some invisible bird your view descends and you begin to make out some of the largest, most impressive details. The huge banners being held aloft by teams of ten or more men. The rolling war machines as big as castles, towers filled with archers and flashes of arcane fire. Beasts the size of elephants, but with spikes down their spines and horns dipped in gold. Giant, man-like creatures with saddles on each shoulder, carrying robed figures, completely hidden from the light of day beneath folds of black and red cloth. Dropping down further, you see the masses of marching men and half-men and near-men and not-men, the officers astride giant cats and horses made of blue fire, the lines of pikes and spears and shields being borne towards each other with inexorable slowness. And now you can hear it, too, the drums, the marching cadences, the piercing cry of the fey beasts being held back by enormous chains of bronze and smoke, the barked orders from atop the war machines, the ululations of the berserkers driving themselves to frenzy before the battle begins. Your view turns, banking to the left and up the slope of a nearby hill, to reveal a tent at the edge of a bluff. A group of men in colorful costumes, ropes of gold and silver, glinting at throat and wrist, watch the armies move toward each other in the valley below. Surrounded by a moat of what looks to be liquid darkness, they stand quietly and observe the gathering hordes. And again your vision wheels. You speed off and above the valley, above the armies, above the tent and the beasts and the growing noise and dust, across the battlefield, up another hill, steeper this time, with a rocky crest and there, yes, two, two figures, almost invisible against the rust-colored rock, clad only in ochre robes and sandals, caked with dust and squatting down low, presenting almost no silhouette above the rock line. Your view dips, and you are there. Two men, one small and compact, ropey muscles beneath a robe, a short black beard and close-cropped black hair, the other with a single bright blue eye and a scar where the other should have been. The second man is very thin and taller, though it's hard to tell as he is bent over, trying to become as small as possible. Say M, the shorter one says. Have we waited too long? The taller one shakes his head. No, Benin. The battle is not meant to be a short one. It must last at least until dusk, when the power of the brothers will be at its height. If we move too soon, some of the blood warriors will escape. They must not be able to reach the shallows of the Tigris. The shorter one looks surprised. Surely even the great mounts cannot outrun, they can't run so far, so fast. The tall one shrugs. I have seen them do so more than once. The other bows slightly as if in deference. If you have seen it, say M, it is surely so. From this vantage the two armies are only writhing bodies in the distance. No detail, no sound, but the distance between them is shrinking. Soon the vanguards will collide. Time passes. Maybe an hour? It's hard to tell, but the shadows below the rocks have moved a few degrees. The sun is hotter, though the sky is still gray. 
The taller of the two men, the one called Sayem, finally nods and speaks a quiet word into the wind. Though you cannot hear the word, it seems to crack the air and fly away from the two men like an invisible arrow. You follow it over the valley, over the armies, over the monsters and the great machines, and the tent and the moat of darkness. You fly swiftly, very swiftly, almost riding the whispered word as it traverses a plain full of small farms, small towns, scratched out dirt roads. You follow alongside a wider road now. Caravans of camels and mules slip by beneath you herds of sheep and goats being led east, the direction you fly, towards the walls of a city. As you fly over the city, you see that its walls are wide, but not particularly tall, maybe twenty feet or so, but topped by a path broad enough to accommodate columns of marchers four men wide. You speed over hundreds of men atop the walls in these files of four, men with bows, men with spears, men with staffs. The city is also not so tall, but wide and airy inside its walls, no buildings over three stories, all made of mud brick, but baked and whitewashed to a shining, almost painful white. Gardens and pools of water disappear beneath you, barracks with more soldiers, yes, but also shops, a market, schools filled with children, studios of artisans, smiths, tinkers, and potters. And in a blink, it is gone. Your whispered word returns you to flight above the plain. More caravans, these heading west, back towards the large, low city you've just left. More herds, more soldiers, more farms and fields. The fields give way to scrubby, sparse woods, skinny trees that barely hold the soil in place, dry, hardy plants that house little life beyond their own bony stems. Then they are gone too, replaced by brown grass, then the grass is gone, and all that flows beneath you is the sand. It doesn't take long, but it seems that the sand goes on forever. By the time you see the rise of land before you, there is nothing visible in any direction but the dunes and blowing arid curtains of desert sand and the occasional outcropping of rock. Nothing lives here. Nothing but a few very slow, very powerful worms who have slept beneath the hot sand for a thousand years or more. You can sense them in the lay of the land. The dunes, seemingly random in their placement, actually follow the lines of the dragon's backs. Their slow breathing, an inhale maybe once in a moon, guides the architecture of wind and sand. And there, at the edge of the desert, arise. A great heap of sand where storms and wind and the breath of sleeping monsters has caused an enormous wall to build up over the centuries. A barrier as implacable and massive as a mountain drawn across this narrowing of land at the edge of nothing. The word you are writing comes to rest beside an old, old man who sits at the base of this wall of sand, his legs crossed, his eyes closed. He is nearly naked, wearing only a loincloth, a turban, and a long white beard. His skin is copper, and his eyes are ink. The word seems to rouse him from a kind of trance. He smiles, rotates his head a few times to loosen his neck, and stands. Looking down at his feet, he takes a few strides up the initial slope of the enormous wall. Within twenty paces, the rise becomes so steep and the sand so loose and shifty that he is unable to move further. He stops and looks to the left for what seems a long, long time, then to the right. Finally, he nods and takes a few sliding steps to his right. And there he kneels and begins to dig with his hands. The sand fills in the hole almost as quickly as he scoops it out, sliding down from the slope above, but he keeps at it. Sweat begins to stain the plain white cloth on his head, and then to trickle down his shoulders and arms. He breathes heavier now, and glances occasionally upwards. Finally the sand that flows into the hole he is digging comes more quickly than he can move it aside, and he allows himself to slide backwards a bit pivoting gracefully on one foot and trotting down to where the sand is flat and hard. Dusting his hands off against each other, he begins to walk away from the mountainous wall of sand behind him. As he walks, he hums a tune. It seems like something a child might sing while doing chores, or maybe a fisherman's ditty. He is no longer breathing hard, and swings his arms to the cadence of his song, marching in time to words only he can hear. 
The whisper of noise behind him is so slight at first that you think it may just be the wind against sand or stone. But it is too regular, too insistent, and now it is growing in volume. A shush that becomes a hiss, and then a moan, and finally a rumble. Your view pivots, and you see that behind the man, in the distance, a cloud of dust is rising. At first it is small, like something a horse would kick up while galloping across the desert, but it grows. Along with the noise that is now a thunder, the clouds swell and become dark. It's not just sand, you realize. It doesn't move like dust. The particles that make it up are heavy and slow, and the noise that is now shaking the earth could not come from falling sand alone. At first the water is a trickle of darkening streaks in the sand, reaching out to turn the ground beneath the old man soft and moist. For a moment he loses his stride and has to skip a little, speeding up a bit, to regain the cadence of his song. But he does so, simply humming faster and picking up the pace. By the time the water begins to splash around his ankles, he has slowed down again, and then as it begins to rise around his calves, he stops. Another word reaches him on a wind from the west. This one you recognize, a name. Asher. The old man nods, smiling again, and speaks one word in return. Saim. The water is now at his knees, and the sound coming from behind him is a roar. He does not turn to see the roiling, churning mass of water and mud roaring towards him almost as fast as sound as it floods the narrow desert valley. He does not see it tower and curl, reaching higher than the walls of the city he faces across the desert, the city of his birth. But he feels it there behind him, feels what it has become, his destructive progeny, and in the moment before it crushes him utterly, he speaks again, sending out a last thought with his final breath. My son, so proud. Your view is wrenched upward, pulled as if on a string or shot from a bow. You look down and see the great mass of earth and water as it grows and strengthens. It is brown and black and gray and juggles boulders the size of houses, as if they were grains of rice. It slows a bit when the desert widens, but soon the force behind it grows too, and the wall of destruction speeds onward. The dragons stir in their sleep as the water rises above them, but they do not wake. The dark mass reaches the edge of the desert and flies across the plain, the noise of its passage a terrible roar. There is no time to see individual farms or flocks as they disappear beneath its thunder, certainly no time to see the people as they are surprised in their fields, their beds and kitchens, at school, marching in the practice yards, at the wheel, the loom, the well. Most have no time for even a final thought as they are obliterated utterly in its passing. Your view gallops faster than the seething waters now. You fly before it, turning back to see its dark erasure of the landscape behind you. For just a moment, the city walls you flew over earlier are bright in contrast against its black power, and then they are gone, too. Not swallowed, not drowned, but crushed. Bricks turn to rubble and flesh ground into paste in an instant. The armies do not have time to turn, but some of the giant riders in black and red seem to sense their doom. They glance back and barely know that their world is about to end, but they cannot utter the words of power. Along with the brutes they ride and the men and other things that have begun the great battle, they are swept into nothingness, ground into meat, and then scraps, and then paste. The water buries the great war machines as it did the shining city, one moment there, the next, gone. Waves of water, rocks, and trees sweep by beneath the view of the men on the cliff above. The wind of the floods passing almost knocks them from their feet, but they have time to react, time to strengthen the moat of darkness that surrounds them. The water reaches, reaches, but then falls back, never quite getting high enough to pull them down. Both armies, though, obliterated, wiped from the face of the earth. Finally, the water begins to calm. It churns, yes, but now in all directions, waves and counterwaves bumping against each other. They level the flood, drawing down from its height. By true night, it is nearly calm, and nothing can be seen but the moonlight on gently lapping waves. You wonder about the two men, 
the ones you'd heard speak earlier, the tall one and the one with the single bright blue eye. But they're gone, at least from your view. You take one more look and see that the richly clad men have built a boat out of fire and are sailing northwest, in the direction the water itself had been flowing. Soon, though, they are out of sight. The scene of blood, battle, and destruction of the flood itself faded from her sight, and Kendra blinked slowly. A face came into focus, a young man's face, framed by already thinning dark hair, cheeks maybe a little full, not quite chubby or fat, eyes a standard medium brown, eyes that were frowning impatiently. That's my part of the bargain, the face said, and Kendra snapped a bit further into focus, seeing the mural of the Parthenon behind him the cheap framed print of an ancient statue that she thought was maybe Roman, not Greek. Looking around slowly, still a bit out of it, she took in the table with its checked plastic cover, the napkin dispenser, the laminated menus, the glasses of water and small pale salads still untouched. The Parthenon, she muttered. Yes, yes, the man's face said, and she looked up at him. Now you owe me. Give her a minute, clerk said a voice to Kendra's left. She turned and saw that there was a black bird sitting on the back of a booth seat. Or was it a young woman in black leather and silver jewelry? Or it was both? She shook her head and almost unconsciously reached for a sip of water. The agreement was, the man continued. Shut it, interrupted the bird girl again. The value is not equal, not even close. You will continue to teach her until I judge that the balance is fair, and then you will get your data. But that wasn't... Shut your mouth, Wallace, the bird interrupted again, or I will stitch it shut. It was a bird. A crow? Yes. Blackbird. Crow. Corva. The girl was gone, unless Kendra turned her head almost all the other way, and then she could still see the leather and pale skin out of the corner of her eye. Things are still a little bit fuzzy, she thought. Kendra turned her head back again to face the man opposite her in the booth. Wallace? Wallace, Wallace, Wallace. Bradstreet. Wallace Bradstreet, right, the guy from the library. He seemed not angry, maybe frustrated? Peeved. Yes, that was the word. You look peeved, she said. At that he smiled, just a little, before returning to his scowl. Not really, he mumbled, playing with his salad. I just want to know more about that mark. The crow, Tess, Kendra remembered now, hopped down to stand on the table between them. He's not a bad sort, the bird explained, but a clerk of sight with a new knowing nearly in his grasp is almost as bad as a young girl with a crush, single-minded and, to others, obnoxiously oblivious to unrelated details, such as the need for food. Tess picked at croutons, and Kendra took another sip of water. The man waited patiently, but barely so. When their meals came, he ate his euro quietly while Kendra plowed through a burger and cinnamon fries. Partway through, Wallace asked, You come to a Greek restaurant for a hamburger? Kendra shrugged. It's a good burger, and the fries are excellent. I normally have just a salad, but I was too stressed out to eat breakfast with Monday's secretary, so... Kaelin, back from bringing a plate of food to Mirker on the street, sat down next to her. Monday's secretary, he asked, chuckling. What's funny? The man across from her was chuckling, too. I swear to God, Kendra said, if you people don't stop treating me like an idiot child and just explain things to me without all the self-satisfied, amused editorial, I will... Tess interrupted. The girl makes a good point. She's basically a day old. Just assume she's a student in a class, and you're her teachers. Behave professionally. Thanks, Tess. Kaelin nodded. I'm sorry, girl, it's just, uh, McKee may look like a secretary to you, but next time, turn whatever of the sight you have on her and really try to see her. While she may perform some administrative duties as part of her function, she's no more secretary than Mercure is my pet. Then what is she? Wallace made an I'm-thinking hard face while waggling his hand in a sort of little of this, little of that gesture. Um, if I had to use mundane terms, he said, I'd call her a combination of consigliere, bodyguard, and assassin. Kendra's eyebrows shot up. 
That nice-looking old lady in the frumpy shoes? Tess spoke up. Remember, dear, that's the seeming put on for mundanes. Well, all righty then, Kendra said. I've never had an assassin buy me hot cocoa, but today's a day for firsts. She went back to eating and then looked up suspiciously at Wallace. So, when you said you were a clerk for Mr. Monday, does that mean you are also... No, he replied. I'm pretty much a clerk. There are other words for it in Reckoner, but the closest mundane translation would also be clerk. What I do is pretty much what I look like I'm doing. Which is? Research for the library's clients. Data entry, that sort of thing. So, you really are a librarian. Wallace shrugged, finishing his water and gesturing to the waitress for a refill. Pretty much. I don't have an MLS, but since I started at the library before that was a thing, I kind of got grandfathered in. MLS? Master of Library Science. Most mundane librarians have a graduate degree. I don't. Which means that sometimes I catch some crap from my mundane friends in the business. He shrugged again. It seemed to be a regular gesture of his, Kendra thought. You have mundane friends? she asked. Brand made it sound like hanging out with non reckoners was, I don't know, uncouth? Wallace waggled his hand again. Eh, it depends. Release isn't much interested in mundanes. There's not much a chronic can lose, break, or lock up that they care about. Sight is different. All kinds of good information comes from outside our domain. I mean, if we were only interested in ourselves, how boring would that be? And some mundane scholars are actually quite perceptive within narrow fields. She nodded. The fact that what he'd just said made about 90% sense to her was comforting. So you, uh, you hang out with regular librarians? He nodded. I kind of have to. Our library has way more mundane patrons than Reckoners. It's part of Mr. Monday's overall strategy, I'd call it. Mundanes handle most of the mundane issues and vice versa for Reckoners, but there ends up being a lot of overlap. And because I specialize in mundane history, we end up together more than most. Another shrug. After a few decades, you get used to them. I think a lot of the prejudice is because most of us just don't spend enough time with them to appreciate some of their good points. Kendra looked up, startled. A few decades? Dude, you don't look that much older than me. Wallace grinned. How old do I look? It was Kendra's turn to shrug. I don't know, 23, maybe 25, max? Tess interrupted before either Kaolin or Wallace could get halfway through another chuckle. Dear, she explained. Reckoners age far, far slower than mundanes in most cases. Aside from exceptions, most notably in Earth, we live many, many centuries. Kendra dropped a cinnamon fry. Centuries? Yes, dear. Unless, again, you're a natural, like Kaolin here. Kendra blinked and shook her head. And how long will Kaolin live? He answered for himself. As you measure time, probably about seven years. She dropped the same fry again. Wait, Wallace here will live for hundreds of years, but you'll be dead at seven. Tess answered, Different domains, different ways, girl. The lives of Earth are tied to seasons very differently than ours, as are their memories and perceptions. Some of what Kaolin remembers will have come from an earlier green man. Kendra shook her head. Lots to learn. Right, answered Wallace, pulling about ten napkins out of the dispenser and wiping his hands. And not just for you. I believe you owe me some information. A shadow fell almost instantly over their table, darkening both the light from the cheap fluorescence overhead and the daylight from the large windows at the front of the cafe. A chill also seemed to seep up from the floor, drawing the warmth from her hands and feet. The noises of the restaurant, too, faded further away. Final warning, boy, said the crow. I will tell you when your side of the bargain is full, and then you can test her mark. Until then, behave. Wallace swallowed quickly and then nodded. For a moment all was still, then the shadow and its chill receded. Kendra was about to ask Tess what that was all about when somebody's phone made a noise. Kaolin reached into his pocket, pulled out a phone, and read something on its screen. He looked up at Kendra, back to his phone, and looked like he was about to say something when the door to the restaurant exploded inward. With her newfound doubled senses, Kendra could tell that the explosion was a way of some sort. In the mundane world, seen to her as through a highly reflective window, it was just the door being opened so violently that it slammed back into the frame with a loud, jangly crash. The waitress, the cook behind the counter, all the patrons, everyone at Kendra's table all turned to look at the same moment. The cook, waitress, and mundane patrons saw four young men, 
in jeans and t-shirts, tattooed and pierced, two of them holding pistols. The two with the guns came through the restaurant while the other two stood by the door, keeping watch on the street. Kendra saw this too, but she also saw four men wearing nothing but body paint and various tools that hung on chains around their waists, wrists, and necks. Their nudity wasn't as shocking to her as the fact that their eyes were entirely black and yet still seemed to glow with a fiery, fey inner light. "'Put all the cash in a to-go bag, man,' the one near the counter said to the cook, who also tended the register. "'Be cool! Be cool!' the cook said. "'I got it! Look, right here! I got it!' While he stuffed money into a plastic bag, the other one with a gun came to stand by Kendra's table. In her new vision, it was not a gun he was holding, but a kind of mirror. It reflected the light from the cafe windows like a crystal prism, and he tilted it to shift the light onto Kaelin first, then Wallace, and finally her. As the light blinked into her eyes, making her squint, time seemed slow for Kendra, yet every detail of her surroundings was shockingly clear. She saw that Tess had lifted off the table and was poised to take flight, beak opened in the beginning of a harsh, high cry. Kaolin was starting to stand, one hand on the table, one moving toward the intruder's mirror. Wallace had shrunk back in his seat and seemed to be staring right through her at something on the wall behind her head. The man with the mirror had a shaved head, she realized. It was painted, too, with the same loops and whorls that wound around his body. They reminded her of the scary Rorschach test from Dr. Leone's office. The mirror seemed to grow larger in the man's hand, and she could hardly keep her eyes open. The light it reflected was bright and getting brighter, almost blinding, but somehow still making the world she could see even clearer. The details of his hand jumped into high definition, tiny delicate tracings painted around each finger, snakes curling around his wrist. She was about to fall into the mirror, she thought which was okay, because the restaurant was filling with acrid smoke, maybe, or steam, or something. But the mirror was safe. That's where she should go to get away from whatever. It looked so nice and smooth and peaceful in the mirror. Just as she was about to lean forward into its bright, flickering surface, a small hand touched her on her knee. She looked away from the mirror for a moment. I'll be right back. And there was a blonde girl there, in a blue kind of frocky dress, like something from another time. She looked to Kendra a bit like John Tenniel's illustrations of Alice, sweet and innocent, but a bit of a scamp, too. In a very bad, overdone, Arnold Schwarzenegger-style Austrian accent, the little girl said, "'Come with me if you want to live.' Kendra was confused, but then the girl smiled, and a pair of huge green wings spread behind her, obscuring the mirror and the painted man, the restaurants, the patrons, and the mural of the Parthenon. "'Parrot girl!' Kendra whispered. The little girl waggled her eyebrows roguishly and held out her hand. Kendra took it, and together they flew away.